Well, amen. It's good to be here tonight and share with you. We had a short song service there. We know we're going to have a short sermon, amen. We may, be, we may be the first ones to go out to eat tonight. It's good to be here. I told Brother Ruben he needs to stop announcing when I'm going to preach on Sunday night and just trick y'all all night. Y'all come thinking he's going to preach, right? It's hard to follow Brother Ruben. He's, he's a talented preacher. And I remember. A few years ago when I surrendered to preach, I ran into Brother Harvey Hoffman, who's gone on to be with the Lord now, but Brother Harvey was excited to hear the news that I surrendered to preach, and if you know Brother Harvey and how he is, he got right up in my face, you know, he pulled me up close, he said, listen here, David, said, you cannot be Paul Carter, <laughs> I know, you cannot be Reuben Weaver, I said, I know, and he went on and listened to several of them. He said, you just got to be David Burns. And I said, well, that's who I intend to be. And my style is probably somewhat different from a lot of preachers, and that's fine. We're going to do what God's called us to do, and we're just going to uh, be obedient to him tonight. I uh, have several of my brothers here tonight. Sammy's down from Northwest Arkansas. We're glad to have him and Miss Linda with us tonight. And Bruce and Debbie's here, and we're glad to have them. Uh, if, you, if you're not sure who they are, they are the ones that have white hair over here in a second. <laughs> I dyed mine white just so I would fit in. <laughs> a couple years ago, the brothers took a road trip up to Colorado and Utah, up through there, and we stopped at a store. I was driving, so I gassed the van up. And while I was gassing up, they went in the store. And so I, I was the last one in there checking out, and the lady said, what, what y'all got going on? This, like a group of y'all, and y'all all kind of look alike. You know? And I said, well, not really. I said, I work for the nursing home, and I'm just driving up there. <laughs> that back and told Dennis that, and he got mad about it. <laughs> Sammy and I are uh, both sports fans, and uh, of course he's in Arkansas, and uh, we'll have to forgive him for that. Right? But uh, we carry on a good bit about about college football, and Sherry told me, she said, David, whatever you do, don't get up there and start talking about LSU football. And so I told her, Sherry, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't talk about LSU going 15 and 0, winning the national championship, right? Having one of the best seasons ever in college football history, and having a Heisman Trophy winner, and Coach O as the coach of the year, and all that. I wouldn't do that, right? It'll come back around the home one day, I'm sure. So. Well, it is good to be here. I, uh, uh, growing up at our house with, with eight, it was eight of us. I'm the youngest. <coughs> Miss Ann died. I'm the youngest. Yeah. <laughs> okay, she got that mixed up tonight. <laughs> but uh, I will tell one story real quick, if I could. Uh, one summer, or not one summer, one fall, uh, Bruce and Sammy saved their money and they wanted to go on a hunting trip to Colorado, elk hunting. And they, uh, they hired a pilot to fly them to Colorado to go elk hunting. And uh, the pilot dropped them off where they were staying for a week. And during that week, they had a good hunt. They killed four elk. And the pilot came back on the last day. He landed to pick them up, to take them back home. They had processed these elk and had them with some big styrofoam ice chest to bring back. When the pilot picked them up, he, he told them, he, he asked them, how many elk did y'all kill? And they said, we killed four. And he said, we can't haul four elk in this little plane. And they said, well, what are we going to do? He said, well, we can't haul that many. And Sammy said, well, last year we killed four elk and we took the same trip and the plane was the identical model of, the, of your plane. And we put four elk on it. And the pilot scratched his head and he said, well, okay, we'll try. And so they loaded the plane down, they took off, and they was flying through a valley, and there was a great big mountain up ahead. And the plane was doing all it could do to try to get up over that mountain. But it didn't make it. And sure enough, they crashed into the side of that snowy mountain. The snow helped cushion the impact. Bruce and Sammy crawled out of the plane 
And Bruce looked around and said, where in the world are we at? And Sammy said, I believe this is the same place we crashed last year. <laughs> I apologize, Bruce. <laughs> if you have your Bibles tonight, we'll go ahead and start preaching, I guess. Uh, Luke chapter 2 tonight. Luke chapter 2. Kind of an unusual message tonight. Uh, the, the style of it, and so uh, you'll just bear with me, maybe even say a little prayer for me tonight as, as we get ready to preach. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 40. Alright, Luke chapter 2, verse 40, we'll read the rest of that chapter. It says, and the child grew, talking about Jesus, and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they saw him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Verse 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Thus dealt with us. And behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things, all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. I do pray you bless it and multiply it. And Lord, just help us tonight to, to glorify you. We come humble tonight, asking for your help. Uh, just lean in on you, Lord, for strength. We pray you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Tonight, I'd like to say that, first of all, in the text, I, won't, I really won't be preaching out of the text, but we read that text to kind of paint a picture tonight of what and why Jesus came to the earth. He tells his parents there that, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? And so we, we want you to remember that as we go through the sermon tonight, that Jesus came to this earth for a reason. And so, uh, you know, there's sometimes that in, in, our, in our lives tonight, there's some events that, that we've gone through, that maybe we've experienced, that we can remember exactly where we were at, maybe who we were with. Uh, and all about that day when we heard the news, maybe whatever it was that happened. For example, we can, most of us in here remember where we were at uh, when we heard about 9-11, when the planes started crashing into the buildings. We could, we could maybe, I remember exactly where I was at and what I was doing, and, uh, and maybe you could too. And maybe there's some other events in your life that were more personal to you that, that you remember. I remember uh, losing several of our classmates in, in high school, and I remember one boy that played on a high school baseball team that, that was killed in a wreck in his truck one day. And I remember where I was at that night when I heard the news that he had been killed. I even remember a song that came on the radio right after I heard that. And even today, 40 years later, when I hear that song, I think about uh, Monty Gilmore, who was killed in his truck one time. And so uh, there's events like that, that that just stand out in our head. We can remember the details about those days. Certainly there's other events. I remember... Uh, when Ronald Reagan was shot, when we got the news, we, uh, our high school baseball team had just gotten off the bus at Hainesville to play them in baseball. And of course, back then, there was no cell phones or anything. When we got off the bus, the other team come to us, and you know they had heard about it, and that the president had been shot. We didn't know if he was dead or alive or going to live or what. And we just knew he'd been shot. And so I remember that very well. But there's another event that maybe uh, some of you remember tonight, if you're old enough, uh, November the 22nd, 1963, uh, John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, we know, was assassinated. Uh, it started off, at, and you know, that was in 63, the election was coming up in 64, 
He was in Texas politicking, traveling. He was going to go to five different cities in Texas in, a, in like four days there. He had already been to San Antonio. He had been to Houston. He was in Fort Worth. And so he spent the night in Fort Worth. He got up that morning. It was a rainy day there in Fort Worth. And he, he gave his speech that morning to a crowd that was uh, there, even in the rain, to hear him. And he left that day or that morning. Him and his wife got on Air Force One. They traveled a short distance to, to Dallas where they got off the plane. The weather had cleared up and it turned out to be a beautiful day. And as they got off the plane, somebody presented the first lady with a big bouquet of flowers. And she would take those flowers with her to the motorcade. And as they head to the motor, motorcade, they, they walk and they get in it. And of course, we know the story that Lee Harvey Oswald was in a building across the street. Uh, ex-Marine who had made like a 96% on his shooting skills in the Marine Corps. He was an expert marksman and uh, on that day uh, he did not miss. And we know that our president was shot. He was 46 years old. He was the 35th president in the United States. Many of you were probably in grade school when you heard the news maybe. It was on Friday and uh, of course I wasn't born yet but I've heard, I remember one of our teachers when I was in probably the sixth grade, I believe, uh, tell us about that day and where she was at and, and how it made her feel and, and, and the, the, the fear that maybe struck America then as our president was killed that day. You can often wonder what it would have been like maybe if he would have lived and, uh, and if he'd been reelected, what things would be different maybe in America even today. And all, all we can do is speculate about that. We don't know if it would have been better or worse or whatever. <laughs> Uh, but the truth tonight is that no matter who our president is, there's always going to be those who, who love our president and there's going to be those who hate our president. And certainly there are those who hate our current president tonight. And that's why I believe, as Brother Reuben has mentioned recently, that we need to pray for our president, no matter who they are. You know, when Obama was our president, I really didn't agree with him or align up with him uh, politically or even spiritually for sure, but I prayed for him, I did. And I, I even prayed many times that he would come to know Jesus as a Savior and get born again, and somehow the Holy Spirit would get a hold of him. And, and I had respect for the office, and we always need to have respect for the, for the office, no matter who's in there. And, uh, and so there are many tonight who hate our president, but uh, we need to pray for him. In God's Word, there are certain events also that have changed history. Uh, when John F. Kennedy was killed, it, it was coined, the phrase was coined, uh, 72 hours that changed America. 72 hours. He was killed on a Friday. He was buried that Monday. And so they call it 72 hours that changed America. In God's Word, in Genesis chapter 6, we see the story of Noah's Ark. And we see that God had, had enough. Man was sinful. In fact, in, in chapter 6, in verses 5 through 8, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. In verse 8 it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We know that this was an event that divided time. Many times things are referred to as before the flood or after the flood. And so this was a great event in history as God had had enough. And he suddenly started all over. And we hit the reset button. And he destroyed man from off the face of the earth except for Noah and his family. And we know how he brought the animals in to preserve them. But can you imagine... For 40 days and 40 nights, the rain, and the Bible says it rained, and the heavens broke loose. And not only the heavens broke loose with rain, but the earth uh, started springing forth water also. And with all that combination, the earth was flooded. Even the highest mountain was flooded with water, and God destroyed the earth. We see that after the flood, that He put a rainbow in the sky. And we talk about the rainbow today, and today in our society, it, it means something else. But I'm here to tell you that that's God's rainbow. And what it means is, 
is that he promised to never flood the whole earth again. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean uh, gay, and homosexual, and queer. It means God's grace on us, his covenant with us. And they've taken something that's holy and spiritual, and they have perverted it to make it their symbol. God forbid that we would do that. And so the ark was there. It was a place of safety for Noah and his family. I think it's a picture tonight, Noah's ark, as they were in the ark. They were protected. They were saved from the flood, from the waters. I believe it's a picture of salvation tonight as we come to Jesus. And we are in him. And we've been born again. We are in God's hand. We are saved. Uh, Brother Adrian Rogers put it this way one time. He said, when you think about Noah's ark, he said, people weren't, Noah and his family were not on the outside of the ark, hanging on to a board that was barely nailed on, and just going up and down, hanging on for life, with their salvation, right? And, and that's the way some people believe tonight, but that's not the way it was. They were inside the ark. They were safe inside the ark. And the question tonight is, are you in the ark? Are you safe tonight? Have you been born again? And so we see that 72 hours changed America. And there were 40 days of rain and floods that, that changed history of mankind, divided time. There was also another event that we find in God's Word. In fact, it's been called the greatest story ever told. It's when Jesus went to the cross. Instead of reading the story tonight, I'm just going to tell you about it, if that's all right. And the question tonight is, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why did Jesus go to the cross? In my sermon tonight, we kind of overflow a little bit or overlap uh, Brother Reuben's sermon this morning. That's always been my biggest fear, by the way. Is he preached my sermon on Sunday morning, and I have to try to dig him in and out on Sunday evening, right? And so we kind of overlap a little bit tonight. That would be all right. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? We look through the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about when Jesus is coming, when the Messiah is coming. It tells all about that. The New Testament tells about when he gets here in his life and his story. But in the Old Testament, there had to be a price for sin. There had to be uh, animal sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. You remember Cain and Abel when he brought their offerings to the Lord? Cain brought an offering from his farm or from his garden, he brought vegetables and fruits and whatever, and Abel brought uh, animal sacrifice. He, he, he brought the blood. And God rejected Cain's offering, and, but he accepted Abel's offering. Why? Because there has to be blood. The Bible says that there has to be blood shed for the remission of sins. Nothing but the blood can wash away our sin. And so, we see tonight that the guy got tired of that. He, you know, and so he said, I'm going to make a sacrifice once and for all. I'm going to send my son Jesus from heaven, who's in heaven with him. I'm going to send him to the earth to become a man so that he can die for the sin of man. And that's what he did. And so we look tonight at the Garden of Gethsemane the night before as Jesus had gathered with his disciples to pray. We remember the story as he took them out to the hillside in the garden that night and he told his disciples to pray. Each time he would come back and he would find them sleeping, they were tired, and, and they were sleeping, and he would go back, and the Bible says he poured his heart out to God, and he even sweat great drops of blood as he prayed that night. Finally, he heard the soldiers coming, and got his disciples up, and said, come on boys, it's time. The time has come. Judas Iscariot was there, he came, and he brought the soldiers to Jesus, and he betrayed the Lord Jesus with a kiss there to let him know who he was. There's an old hymn, an old Christmas hymn that says, Jesus, baby Jesus, there's a cross along the way, born to die for sinners, born for crucifixion day. Out in front of our sanctuary, outside, there's a big wooden cross that's been put up a few years ago. Early in the morning when the sun comes up, if you when you get back on the west side of that cross, you would see a shadow of the cross. In the evening, when the sun sets, you could get on the other side, on the playground side, and you can see a shadow of the cross. And I'll tell you tonight that even as a, a little man, Jesus walked in the shadow of the cross. 
and going back to our text, that's why he was here. He was about his father's business. Jesus walked in the shadow of that cross his whole life, knowing that one day it's coming. One day he would give us life. One day he would pay, pay the price for all of us there at Calvary. After the, uh, Judas had betrayed Jesus, the, the soldiers came and they took him away. The Bible says that they all forsook. The disciples left. They were scared. It says that Peter followed from a distance as they took him to the palace to question him to the temple there. Peter followed from a distance. We know later that night that Peter would deny the Lord three times before the rooster crowed. Early the next morning, they carried Jesus to Pilate. And Pilate began to question him. And this was the time of the festival. It was customary every year at this time that they release a prisoner. And Pilate said, uh, we're going to release one. He was, he was kind of hinting to maybe release Jesus. And he asked the question, what shall I do with Jesus, with this Jesus? The crowd began to cry out, free Barabbas, free Barabbas. And he asked the question again, what shall I do with this man named Jesus? And the crowd cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And so they took him and they beat him and they scourged him, the Bible says. It says they put a purple robe on him, a crown of thorns on his brow. And they mocked him and they ridiculed him and they spit on him. One of the worst things I believe they did says that they bowed down and worshipped him. They mocked him and worshipped him. And think about that tonight. And I wonder how many times we come in here and we mock the Lord with our worship. And we don't mean it. And we just come and go through the motions. And maybe we try to do something to be seen of other men to try to impress somebody. But it really doesn't mean anything in our heart when we worship the Lord. And I would caution us tonight to make sure, because the Bible says that we need to worship Him in spirit and in truth. That means we need to have a pure heart as we come to His presence and worship Him. They mocked Him in worship. They spit on Him. They beat Him with a cane. They beat Him with the palm of their hands. And they made fun of Him. I often think about that crown of thorns they placed on His brow and, and pray, you know, pressed it down there and the pain that it must have caused our Lord that day. And they led him out to the cross and they led him to Golgotha. They drove the nails through his hands and his feet and they picked that cross up and they placed it in a hole. And there Jesus hung on the cross between two thieves. The Bible says it was about nine o'clock in the morning when they raised that cross up as he, as he was on that cross. Max Lucado wrote a book one time called Six Hours, One Friday. And it's about those six hours that Jesus spent on the cross. And if we think about it, that's a long time to have to suffer and go through something and pain like that. But Jesus was willing to do that. In Mark 15, chapter verse 34, it says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then in verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And there he died. And it was about 3 o'clock in the evening that when he died, six hours later. Six hours, one Friday. Six hours, one Friday. The bridge was... The gap is bridged between God and man as Jesus gave his life there for us. And we need to see that picture tonight. That there was a separation between God and man because of sin. And Jesus was the only thing that could bridge that. And so as we see the picture of Jesus on the middle cross tonight, I want us to imagine that he has the hand of man in one hand and the hand of God in the other hand. And he bridges that gap. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We know today that there's so many different religions and, and things out there. And, and, you know, even Oprah and some of those, they say there's many ways to get to heaven. We know that's not true tonight. 
Jesus is the only way. He's the only way that we can get to heaven. And not only through him, and only by his blood. But you see, that six hours on Friday is not the end. On the third day, we see these ladies, Mary Magdalene, and some of these ladies that come to the tomb of the Lord Jesus. They wanted to attend to his body. They get there early in the morning, the Bible says. They walk into the tomb, and there's an angel there. And the angel knows why they're there, and he makes this comment, Hey, Jesus is not here. He is risen. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Go tell the other disciples, go tell Peter that Jesus is alive. That's the greatest news that they could have ever heard. And it's kind of funny to me that, that later on we read where they told the disciples and the Bible says and they believe not. We have to remember Jesus had told these guys several times that I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again on the third day. This temple is going to be torn down and going to rebuild it in three days. But every time he told them, the Bible says they didn't understand. And I probably wouldn't have either if I'd been there. But we see this story that 72 hours changed for America. And 40 days of rain and flood changed history. And six hours, one Friday, bridged the gap between God and man. It gave us a way to God. If we remember the question that Pilate asked, what shall I do with this Jesus? I'd like to ask you the question tonight. What are you going to do with Jesus? You see, what we do with Jesus here on this earth will determine where we spend eternity. In Romans 10, 9, the Bible says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Six hours, one Friday. What does that mean to you? I'm going to end with a little poem we wrote some time back. It says, Many years ago in a land far away, a baby was born all nestled in the hay. He grew so fast and soon he would understand that he was not your average ordinary man. They marveled at his wisdom and ability to heal, but how quickly they turned and wanted to kill. While on earth he hungered, he hurt, he cried, for this man knew he was born to die. The tree that made the cross had grown <clears throat> for many years, and now it was stained with his blood and tears. It is finished. Was this really God's son? By all accounts, Satan had won. But God was not done. He had a plan. The blood of Jesus was shed to rescue man. He raised him from the grave to reign on high. This man knew he was born to die. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, his question to you, who do you say I am? I'm going to ask Brother Ross to come. We'll have a song here. If you need to come to the altar and pray, or if you need to come and share with me, and I'll pray with you, whatever God tells you to do, to be obedient tonight. Let's stand as we sing. Thank you. 